Good morning and welcome to our event, Investing in a New Colombia. My name is Adriana Larrota. I'm Senior Director of Media Relations at the America Society and Council of the Americas. And uh, I'm also a columnist with the Colombian newspaper, El Tiempo. So before we begin, I want to thank uh, ProColombia, our partner for this event, and its president, uh, Felipe Jaramillo. I also want to give a special welcome to our other speakers today, Julio Babeki, partner at El Caterton, Terry Dale, president and CEO of USDOA, the United States Tour Operators Association, and Thomas McDonald, managing partner and co-founder of Jaguar Growth Partners. And finally, I want to welcome everyone joining us from around the world via webcast. We are here to discuss investment opportunities in post-conflict Colombia. I don't need to tell uh, anyone in this room what a game changer piece with the FARC insurgency represents for the Colombian economy. As you know, for the better part of the last five decades, large portions of the country were out of bounds for business to, to the threat of the guerrilla activity. Uh, tourism opportunities, and we are going to discuss that today, uh, in what is surely one of the most attractive destinations in Latin America were kept in check due to the country's reputation for insecurity. Now, we believe and we thought all these risks are a thing of the past, and peace with the FARC is opening up a multitude of opportunities in a broad range of new and non-traditional industries. The timing for this event couldn't be better. We are not only marking the uh, five years of the US-Colombia Free Trade Agreement, but also the Colombian President Juan Manuel Santos will be tomorrow in Washington uh, to meet with President Donald Trump, and uh, we appreciate trade, security, perhaps investment uh, are going to be on the agenda. So now I would like to invite uh, Felipe Jaramillo, President of ProColombia, to join me at the podium. Uh, Felipe is going to provide us with an overview of uh, Colombia at this particular and, and special stage uh, and the opportunities that the country has to offer. So Felipe. Good morning, thank you all for being here. Uh, thank you, I wanna give a special thank you to the Council of the Americas for their support and for working along with ProColombia in the organization of this important event. I'm not gonna take long, uh, I'll, I'm gonna take 15, 20 minutes to talk a little bit about the Colombian economy and the investment environment right now in the country. So allow me to start by, by saying that uh, the country that we have today, it's completely different than the country that we had 15, 20 years ago, even 10 years ago. Um, I don't need to tell you this, but the peace process uh, has been a milestone when it comes to the development uh, and the objectives that we have as a country in terms of improving the quality of life for, for all Colombians. Uh, I was having a conversation with Terry just last week uh, back in Bogota, actually in, in Zipaquirá, in the Salt Cathedral in Zipaquirá, uh, and I was telling him how I'm a great admirer of my predecessors, of the president of ProColombia, because I can only imagine how difficult it was to pr promote Colombia around the world 15 years ago. Uh, it, it was quite a challenge to get people to visit our country, to invest in our country. So it's not that it's an uh, incredibly easy job now, but it's obviously a great momentum um, for Colombia in terms of investment, tourism, economic development. Uh, so I'm just gonna as I said earlier, talk a little bit about uh, the um, Colombian economy and the investment environment right now in the country. So one interesting fact is that during the last uh, decade, the macroeconomic indicators of Colombia 
are comparable to the ones of a developed country. Uh, in fact, the average GDP growth for the country in the last 10 years is above 4%. That places Colombia uh, among the two or three top uh, economies when it comes to growth in the Latin American region. And perhaps more importantly, this growth is coming from the, uh, f for, from the right reasons. First, consumer consumption, that's obviously very important. And secondly, total investment within the economy. This is all obviously a great indicator of the confidence that not only uh, the institutions and the private sectors have in the Colombian economy right now, but also international investors that are seeing with uh, more interest the Colombian market right now. And this trend is going to continue uh, during this year. Uh, it is projected that Colombia is going to grow at a 2.3% during 2017. Uh, this again continues maintains Colombia as the second or third, third, third uh, fastest uh, growing economy in Latin America right now. And this 2.3%, it's not bad if you consider that uh, the region as a whole, Latin America, it's not um, undergoing the best of uh, economic circumstances right now. So again, I think Colombia has, make, has made a good job in absorbing the effects of the drop in oil prices. As probably uh, some of you already know, the Colombian economy uh, had a, a level of dependency on, on, on oil that uh, was uh, higher than uh, we would have expected or that we wanted at some point. In fact, 20% of uh, the government revenue came from oil. That's all gone for the moment, at least while well, the prices that we have right now continue at the, at the level that, that, that they are. Uh, and that means that the government last year and this year in 2017 had to uh, find other sources of revenue because that 20% uh, that we had from oil, it's gone at least for the moment. Another important fact is that Colombia has uh, worked really hard, the Colombian government has worked really hard in the last few years to create the right business environment within the country. Uh, in, in fact, Colombia continues to rank among the top economies in Latin America uh, in the Doing Business Index of the World Bank. And in many of the issues that are uh, of more, more, more importance to um, investors, we, could, we rank one or second within the Latin American region. And as I said earlier, the Colombian economy uh, is well known around the world, or the Colombian government is well known around the world for the macroeconomic responsibility when it comes to uh, the management that they've had um, of the economy in the last uh, 10 years or so. Uh, and as you can see, Colombia ranks second in the region as well when it comes to the macroeconomic stability index of the World Bank as well. And this is perhaps the most important figure or number that we're going to see today. The middle class in Colombia has been growing consistently uh, since uh, 2002, uh, while at the same time the, poor, the poverty rate has been declining um, at the same level. Today we have a middle class that is above 30% of the population, and that is making the Colombian market very interested, interesting to international investors. The local market is um, becoming more and more interesting because not only we have a growing middle class, but obviously we have a, a quite significant population within the country, almost 50 million people. So obviously when you compare this uh, demographic, and uh, economic situation of the Colombian population with the other countries in the Latin American region. Uh, Colombia um, obviously uh, seems as one of the most interesting markets uh, at the moment. And obviously, in addition to, to the growing middle class and the good performance of the economy, is the, there's the strategic location of the country. Colombia is located in the middle of the Americas. Uh, we're when it comes to the U.S., we're very close to many of the most important U.S. cities, uh, 
Bogota, our capital, is only three hours away. From uh, Miami, five hours away. From New York, and we have very good connectivity, uh, air connectivity with all of the US, with the Americas, with Europe. We have FTA's agreement with all of the Americas, with Europe, with some countries uh, in Asia, and that obviously makes Colombia a very interesting option when it comes to uh, an export hub for the, for the region. And we have also been working really hard in recent times to protect uh, investment uh, from abroad. Uh, Colombia uh, has been ranking consistently as the best country in the, re in the region when it comes to uh, protection of international investment. And in addition to this, uh, the quality of the local suppliers uh, is highly regarded uh, by different international institutions. And this is obviously very important for companies in the manufacturing sector, in the services sectors that are thinking about the, the possibility of establishing their businesses in, in Colombia. And as many of you have probably experienced uh, when visiting Colombia or doing business in Colombia, the human capital in Colombia is amazing. Uh, it's known for being one of the best in the region, in, if not the best. Uh, Colombians are talented, committed, disciplined, and that's obviously very important uh, for many industries um, that see Colombia as a, as a potential destination for investments. Uh, the services uh, sector has been growing uh, double di digit rates in, in recent times, and not only because of that, but obviously the quality of the human uh, capital in the country has uh, had a major impact in that, in that situation. And there's some other facts that um, are making Colombia a safer de destination when it comes uh, to investment, a more predictable market when it comes to investment. Uh, we're about to become a full member of the OCD. Uh, I don't wanna uh, get into trouble by making an a, a, a actual prediction on when that's gonna happen, but. We're really hopeful that by the end of this year, Colombia is going to be a member of, of the OCD. Uh, this is an organization that uh, sometimes is referred to as uh, the rich countries uh, uh, organization, but more than that is the organization of countries that have good practices that manage their economies in responsible ways. So for investors, it's very important that Colombia is about to become a member of this organization because it means that future governments would have to continue to manage the economy in a responsible manner. Finally, uh, I just want to spend uh, a couple of minutes talking about the opportunities and the investment opportunities, and perhaps the most important investment opportunities that we're seeing in different sectors within the Colombian economy. Obviously, the agro-industry sector is one of um, the sectors that is benefit, benefiting the most from the peace process. Colombia has been labeled uh, by the UN as one of the seven countries with the highest potential when it comes to agriculture in the world. Uh, out of the 11 million hectares uh, that are um, uh, that could be used for agriculture, right now we're only using 4 million. So the potential for growth there is huge. Um, the government is investing really hard uh, in the regions of the country that were hit the hardest by the conflict. Many of the, those regions have some of the thermal floors and quality of the land that are best for agriculture. So the potential is huge. And many international investors are seeing that and are investing in different products, uh, in different projects within the agro sector in, in, in Colombia right now. Uh, obviously, tourism is booming. Uh, we're gonna talk in more detail uh, later on about, about that. But uh, tourism in Colombia right now, it's growing at double digit rates. Uh, last year, uh, during 2016, we grew 
14% uh, the number of international visitors going to Colombia grew by 14% that's that's three times the glob uh, the global average when it comes to uh, growth in the tourism industry. So it's an industry that is becoming more and more important for the Colombian economy right now. It's the second largest sector within the Colombian economy. And uh, international investors are seeing that as well. We've seen um, the opening of more than uh, 180 hotels just in the last six years. There's been more than 85 billion in, in, in investment in, in the tourism industry. Uh, and we will we're expecting to, to see those numbers grow rapidly in the, in the next few years. Uh, it's been only a year, less than a year, since the peace agreement was signed. And there's many regions of the country that have a lot of potential when it comes to tourism. Colombia is um, a country of many natural wonders, many of which was, were, were impossible to visit before the, the, the peace agree agreement was, was signed last year. So we're hopeful that the world will continue to see Colombia with interest. Uh, many, if not all, the uh, important publications within the tourism sector have included Colombia as one of the top destinations for visiting, uh, to visit during this, this year. Lonely Planet choose Colombia as the second country or the second top destination to be seen during this year. So there's a great momentum. Terry is probably going to talk a little bit about that later on. But we definitely believe that uh, tourism will continue to drive uh, in a good level the, the growth within the Colombian economy. These are some of the chains that uh, have uh, invested in the last uh, four or five years in, in the country. There's many more. I, I, I would there to say that all of the major uh, international hotel chains have now presence in, in Colombia. In services, as I was mentioning earlier, and that's probably the sector that is growing the most right now when it comes to international investment, and not only because of the, the strategic location, we're in the same time zone as the US, uh, and obviously the good uh, connectivity, both in terms of air connectivity and IT connectivity that we have with the rest of the Americas, but also, as I was mentioning earlier, the good quality of the human uh, capital in Colombia. That's obviously critical in a sector like services and uh, international investors, international companies within the services industry are noticing that and they're um, investing uh, more and more in, in Colombia. So finally, I just wanted to invite you, invite you again to consider Colombia uh, as an investment destination. Uh, we at ProColombia are ready to help to give you all the information regarding the market. Uh, we truly believe that this is the best moment in, in Colombian history. Uh, and we see a lot of potential for international investors right now in different sectors. Uh, the Colombian economy, uh, as you know, uh, endure a lot of problems that were related to the internal conflict. Now that we have peace, the economy would flourish, will grow even faster. Uh, and obviously, early adapters, early goers, to, uh, early takers of these opportunities will see higher returns. So again, uh, we'll, we invite you to consider Colombia and its opportunities that are opening now with the peace process. Thanks so much. Thank you very much, Felipe, and I will now uh, like to invite our distinguished panelists to come to the stage. You can come this way. So uh, thank you, Felipe. That was, um, I didn't know that the OECD admission is really, hopefully, around the corner. So that's really good news. Uh, there is no doubt, uh, and uh, I'm the problem of being Colombian, so I can really see how the country has, uh, uh, is in a, in a huge uh, 
transformation process, uh, especially in, in recent years. And uh, it's attracting uh, uh, attention and investment uh, that is of a different kind than it did before. And the panel we have today will show exactly that. And I think the benefit of having uh, these distinguished panelists is that they are not just interested in, in Colombia, they are actually investing in Colombia. So uh, because there are uh, not many of them uh, so far, we hope that there will be more and more. So you will be able hopefully to share some of your experiences uh, without going obviously on uh, information that is uh, confidential. I will try, but I suspect I won't succeed. Um, so uh, I'm gonna pose questions to you, but I hope you intervene and, and uh, comment on each other's uh, remarks and contradict yourselves. And since you have Felipe here, so you can also complain to the government uh, about the things that are not uh, going well. So I would like uh, first to start by asking each of you to explain what your companies or your organizations do and is what, uh, what is what you do and you are doing in Colombia. Okay, sure. So I'm Julio Aveki. I'm a partner of uh, El Caderon, which is a uh, private equity uh, fund, global private equity fund, focused on consumer goods and uh, retail. Um, we manage about uh, $12 billion in a platform of uh, six, uh, or rather, you know, six platforms of, uh, of funds that are the result of a merger of two large uh, uh, private equity funds uh, of earlier in, in 2016. One was Catterton, which was a U.S. platform of funds. We have a buyout and a, a number of buyouts and a number of um, growth funds uh, operating in the U.S and the Latin American Fund, which is the one I, I work with, and I'll, I'll just talk about it uh, for, for two minutes in a second. And we merged that platform. This is a uh, private equity fund that was founded about uh, in the 90s, so about 27 years ago. We merged that uh, platform, uh, as I said earlier, in 2016 with El Capital, which was a uh, private equity fund based in uh, Europe, Asia, and uh, also a real estate fund in Europe. I was sponsored by LVMH, Louis Vuitton, Moet Tennessee, the, uh, the luxury uh, goods, uh, the French luxury goods uh, group. So we, we merged those two uh, platforms, as I say, earlier in, in 16, and we created this uh, multi-regional uh, platform with about, as I said, $12 billion uh, under man and the management of 140 professionals in 17 offices. In my case, I, uh, I am in the um, Latin American Fund, which is a $400 million uh, fund that we actually uh, just uh, finalized uh, the fundraising uh, earlier this year. And uh, we have the same brief, investing in uh, consumer goods and uh, retail in the region, in this case. And um, we've done four investments since we, we were, since we were um, uh, raising, we were raising the fund and in parallel we were investing in the region. We've done uh, um, a couple of investments in uh, Colombia. We invested, uh, and there was our first investment in the fund was Bodytech, which is uh, a Colombian, but uh, working across uh, the region, um, uh, gyms uh, chain with about 150 uh, gyms in uh, Colombia, Chile, and Peru. It's one of the, the leading uh, gym chains in the, in the region. Um, and we also bought through a, uh, in this case, through one of our portfolio companies in Asia, we bought Maji, which is a uh, swimwear, a leading swimwear uh, Colombian uh, company based in uh, Medellin that we, we merged with one of our portfolio companies in Australia called uh, Cifoli. And apart from that, we have a few other investments. We've done a couple of investments uh, in, uh, in uh, Brazil. And uh, we've invested in uh, one company in Argentina as well. In the last, uh, we closed that transaction a couple of uh, a couple of months ago. That's, that's Good morning, everyone. My name is Terry Dale, and I'm the president and CEO of the United States Tour Operators Association, based here in New York City. Forty-eight hours ago, I got off a plane from Bogota uh, to JFK, and I consider myself now an unofficial ambassador on behalf of Colombia. All I can say is this was my first visit. What took me so long? because we will talk about that uh, extraordinary experience that ProColumbia provided us over the past week. Uh, I'm president of the largest, most prestigious, of course I'm biased, tour operator association here in the United States. 
uh, we have 160 different tour operator members who take U.S. travelers to every corner of the world. PwC tells us that we're a $15 billion industry. Our members purchase over $10 billion in goods and services. My job is to see how much additional growth we can generate in Colombia so that you're getting your fair share of that $10 billion of purchases in goods and services. Um, we are a lobbying organization in Washington, D.C. Uh, issues like travel bans, banning electronics are also high priorities for us. Uh, we want to keep the U.S. population traveling, and there is no reason why Colombia isn't the perfect fit uh, for our members today. And I look forward to sharing more of, it, of that with you uh, later. Thank you, Thomas. Uh, good morning. Thomas McDonald, co-founder, managing partner of Jaguar Growth Partners. And before I talk about Jaguar and our experience in Colombia, I wanted to um, hopefully give some good news to the Colombians in the room. The um, peace process and success of the peace plan is not only on certainly everybody's mind here, investors' mind, but I'll tell you, when I mentioned to my nine-year-old daughter yesterday that I was going to be speaking on a panel about Colombia, she said, oh, Papa, you know, there was a peace agreement that happened in Colombia. It's very good. And she said, I, and I said, yeah, we may talk about that. It's a fantastic advancement, very important for the country. She's like, yeah, I have a pin. One of my classmates gave me a pin, and so I want you to wear it. And so this pin is a reflection of not only the success, the hard work and dedication that's gone to achieve that, but also importantly how the good news is not only on the minds of investors and Colombians, but filtering down to little nine-year-old girls here in New York. So. Congratulations. Good, good news. Um, I, uh, with Gary Garibrand, founded Jaguar Growth Partners four years ago. We're an emerging market real estate investment platform. Our first two funds are private equity real estate investing focused on Latin America. We've got other uh, products and activities that we're doing elsewhere in the world. Our first fund closed uh, at the end of last year. Similarly to Julio, we were investing while we were fundraising and have completed the investment of that fund. We've got uh, our first investment, LATAM Logistics Property, is a logistics warehouse distribution business operating in Peru, Colombia, and Costa Rica. Uh, second business was uh, a large shopping center business in Brazil, Allianz. Third, a Mexican uh, limited service hotel business, Hotel City, that also operates in Colombia, Chile, and Peru. And then lastly, another uh, logistics business in Mexico called Vesta. But we invest in and look for scalable, world-class operating platforms across the real estate sector, help grow, build those businesses, and attract institutional, either public or private capital. We've been uh, invested in, in, in Colombia in this new iteration of our business for the past two years. Previously, we'd invested in Colombia uh, probably five or six years ago. I began traveling to Colombia in the late 90s. Uh, so it was, at the time, dangerous, and I would say off the radar of institutional investors. In fact, when we started with our previous business, ironically, in 99, 2000, Colombia was quote unquote toxic, and Venezuela was actually very interesting. And we invested in Venezuela, in fact, <laughs> And we're lucky enough to um, save through our partners 60 or 70% of our equity while Chavez was changing the monetary policy and expropriating assets. So we, we actually did very well and had great lessons learned through our investment in Venezuela. But you fast forward 15 years, and now Venezuela is toxic, and Colombia is one of the jewels in Latin America. So interesting how, how times change. But we're very bullish on Colombia and, and the region and, and happy to be here today. And, and uh, the, perhaps of the three of you, you have the most experience going to the region. What changed and how uh, uh, did you realize that Colombia was really an opportunity, was not toxic? Well, uh, even while, you know, in the late 90s, mid 90s, despite things being dangerous, Colombia had some um, distinguishing characteristics, some of which were, were shown to us earlier this morning. We were impressed by the diversification of the country. There are four or five quote unquote real cities throughout Colombia as opposed to most of the other Latin American countries where you've got 30 or 40% of the GDP, sometimes more, 
and population in the capital and the rest are kind of also ran cities. Um, we were impressed with the relative economic growth, stability, and even, you know, certainly now the last 10 years, the data shows, you know, relative economic growth, relative currency stability, relative, again, all relative political stability. And I would say more recently we've been impressed with the reverse of what we saw in, through the 90s and into the early 2000s, which was a what we call a brain drain, where where a lot of the um, aspirational folks, young young people, were leaving Columbia for a myriad of reasons, some of which security certainly, studying outside Columbia and ended up working outside and staying in either in Europe or or the U.S. And what we've seen in the last five or seven years is a lot of that talent coming back after having gain real, real experience, as well as the youth staying in Columbia or studying and coming back. And so there's a very deep talent pool uh, on the executive class that we, we also appreciate. Thank you. Yeah. Maybe I'll just um, pick up on what Thomas shared with you. We had uh, an extraordinary presentation in Medellin um, on economic development and the transformation that has taken place there. And one word that they used consistently throughout the entire presentation was intervention. And I was somewhat surprised at the selection of the word, but it made sense. So they talked to us about the intervention within early education, uh, intervention in the infrastructure, intervention in green spaces. And they ticked off all of these developments that have taken place over the last decade uh, that were nothing short of extraordinary. And I think part of our responsibility and certainly part of my responsibility now that I'm back from Columbia is to share the story of the transformation uh, that has taken place there. And they've been very strategic in how they've allocated their human capital as well as their financial investments. And I think we're seeing uh, the payoff from that now. That's a, a really interesting point that I, I think is crucial for the three of you. Uh, in your case, you were really impressed by the quality and people being very hospitable. Uh, in your cases, uh, you need really to have uh, uh, good workforce. The quality of the manage management is really important. So I want you to refer to that. What do you see in Colombia? And perhaps uh, how does it compare with other countries in the region? Yeah. So, so well, first, as a consumer uh, investor, uh, investor, we obviously focus in the large consumer market uh, in the region. And obviously, as, as has been said, uh, uh, Colombia is one of them where you have uh, good uh, tailwinds in terms of uh, a, a strong growth in the uh, middle class, mm -hmm. uh, increasing the purchasing power of that middle class, and uh, that has access to more of the kind of uh, goods and services that we want to offer them and, and, and sell them. So that's, those are kind of the micro things that we look for. Um, as investors, though, we really very much focus, to your point, on, on the micro, I, on these specific uh, opportunities. I think we, we try and leverage in um, some of the sectors and areas where we, find, we think that some of the, the, those countries have a, a certain legit legitimacy. Uh, I think in the case of Colombia, for instance, one of the categories that we've invested, we've done a lot of investments in the past uh, across uh, the world, is in apparel and, uh, and accessories and all that, uh, that kind of um, uh, businesses. And obviously in Colombia, in particular in some areas in Colombia, and Medellin in particular, you have a very strong uh, manufacturing uh, capabilities of uh, apparel, swimwear as well, it's just a case of Maji, but in general uh, apparel. And there is a clearly a certain levels of uh, quality in terms of the, the, the supply and the maquilas in the, in the region. So this is obviously something that attracts us because that's not something that uh, you, you have, uh, that is so, uh, you have that often in, in markets. So that's, that's, for instance, an area where we, where we, uh, we focus on and we've looked at a number of uh, businesses in that, uh, in that space. I think with respect to, uh, to your uh, particular industry, uh, one other thing that uh, we see as a trend uh, overall in the world is that uh, people are more looking for experiences over things. And this is one of our categories that we uh, focus on, and it could be uh, in wellness, uh, health, uh, but also travel, tourism, and so on. And, uh, and again, there, I think in Colombia, there is, uh, there is clearly that, uh, that uh, opportunity to, do, uh, to invest in companies, and not only in, 
in uh, in uh, hotels, uh, but things like uh, casual dining, we've looked at a number of uh, very specific uh, and interesting casual dining uh, business, uh, concepts in, in Colombia, which again is more about the experience than the um, than the actual food that you get. Although food is also important, but again, so we we kind of focus on the categories that we think that the country is particularly uh, good and they have uh, good uh, good opportunities. And I think you know so far in terms of the management teams, we found that. You know the management teams that you find in in uh, Colombia and the partners, because often we are minority uh, investors in some of those businesses, are uh, are in particular in the in those categories where we feel the company the country has something to say. I think they're they're the world class. They're uh, trustworthy. Uh, often they've been trained uh, in many places uh, around the world, and uh, so far the experience has been has been great. Mm -hmm. And I feel, Thomas, you have had a similar experience. With we, management. We have had uh, a, a positive experience with management. I think also one thing that distinguishes Colombia versus the rest of Latin America and, and more broadly emerging markets on the government side, and we were impressed by that um, with not only the current but also previous administration, was bringing in folks from the private sector to be involved in the government. And part of this is what I mentioned before about people coming back to Colombia and applying experiences that they've had from outside Colombia in, but also people within the pri private sector within Colombia getting into government and feeling compelled to contribute, compelled to uh, provide the public service. And what that means is it shows up you know, on things like ease of doing business that Felipe showed, but there's also a much more practical, effective, efficient conversation. We talk about what the company, what the country needs and what we as investors look for through our portfolio companies. So I think it is a very good, blend and it's a powerful combination of both strong uh, human capital on the management side, um, transparency, we're very focused on uh, fiduciaries being good stewards of capital for our in institutional partners. So we pay very close attention to how things get done, uh, Foreign Corrupt Prop Practice uh, Act, etc. We're bound by that and so transparency is very important and feeling um, comfortable when you're sitting across from somebody that they actually understand and have the best interests of the government uh, in our conversation is very important as well. Mm -hmm. yeah. And w w we like to uh, talk about, or we did talk about the three P's of Columbia, which people, passion, and pride. And why that's important is the authenticity and the genuineness that comes through when the interaction takes place between whether you're an investor or you're a visitor to that country. And, and that's why we think there's so much potential uh, for Colombia, because every country uh, has pride in their people, as they should. But there's something really unique and special uh, about the Colombian citizens uh, that just came through in such a strong and compelling way uh, last week when we were visiting. So it's that immersive experience that you want in a very authentic and real way in which they deliver it. Uh, we, uh, I appreciate, uh, and I cannot avoid being Colombian, I'm feeling flattered by your <laughs> comments, but uh, we need I'm to still on a high. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. So, uh, but uh, we, we need to talk a little bit about things that may uh, also not be uh, as good as they should, that may hinder business. I wanted to talk about maybe uh, in your experiences, bureaucracy or regulatory framework that has any impact uh, whatsoever, maybe your industries are really far away from that, but uh, if you have any experiences to share, any uh, of you. You know, we're, it's, it's anecdotal, and so I, I wouldn't uh, position this as being symptomatic, but certainly things that we, um, we struggle with, and, and again, it's not unique to Colombia, and I think relative to a lot of other countries, it's probably better in Colombia, but things like um, permitting for land, we're, we're developing a piece of uh, land, a 50 hectare, uh, so that's a uh, 120 acre plus or minus uh, piece of land for uh, our logistics business. And um, we, we've got the capital, we have te tenant demand, but we're waiting for the permits to get through to allow us to do what needs to be done. And that's a bottleneck, it's, um, but again, I think it's, it's probably not much worse in Colombia than it is in other places where we're doing this, Peru, uh, Mexico, Brazil. Um, so those are, you know, I would say necessary evils, but certainly to the extent that those were able to get fast-tracked, uh, it's better. I mean, the government 
benefits from employment, tax generation, investment. Um, there's no real good reason for, for delays. They just uh, seem to take place. Yeah, and to that point, you know, perhaps, yeah, I mean, in our case, uh, we sometimes uh, have a similar trouble in the licenses of the stores that we open. And, but that, again, I think that's, that's pretty common to the, to the region, so I don't think that's specific to the, to the region. What is true is that, uh, from our point of view, to do uh, retail businesses uh, in, uh, in Colombia is not that easy because the real estate is very expensive. And, uh, and you really need to have the, the stores uh, produce uh, high margins uh, and high revenues for, for you to, to be able to pay the, uh, the rent and sometimes even the key money that goes with some of those uh, key locations. And uh, what, what I suppose, and although there's kind of a, uh, an ongoing uh, growth of the mall uh, uh, space uh, that has been constructed uh, currently, but I th that's directly a result of the lack of quality uh, retail uh, uh, malls that, uh, that you know, would allow you to have more, more, uh, more offer in order to kind of put a little bit pressure down on, on rents and, and on key monies on that. So, and I think that may be related to the fact that you know, there's this uh, problems in, in f developing fast some of those uh, real estate uh, you know, uh, projects. And another cause of, especially on the mall space, and it's again, not, s not unique to, to Colombia, but, but traditionally there hasn't been financing available. And so in the United States and other developed markets, a developer will be able to get financing, maybe able to even finance the land, build, build the shopping center, own it, and then lease out to different tenants, but have one owner, one operator, provide a much more consistent uh, operation, better quality operation in places like Columbia and elsewhere. The developer can't get financing, so they need to sell store by store. So at the end of the day, the developer may develop a mall that has 100 stores in it, but it has 99 other owners. Maybe he's lucky to stay with one store, and that creates issues for leasing to the tenants because people are competing against the store next to them to try and get the best lease. Some people take care of the space, others don't, and provides for uh, a less than ideal scenario for the tenants and for the users. And so I think in the case, and, and happy to say, um, Columbia today offers relatively good financing for real estate, again, versus the neighbors, Brazil, Peru, uh, Chile is probably even better than Colombia, but, uh, but relative to, to most of the markets, the financing has improved quite a bit in Colombia, but still a challenge. And perhaps there is a, there are another opportunity for other sectors to go into Colombia to really support the efforts that uh, current investors like yourselves are already doing. I was curious, Terry, about the infrastructure you found in terms of uh, hotels. Uh, right, right. So I would say um, clearly one of the assets that Colombia has is the diversity uh, that the country represents, both in product and people. But what we need to see happen as it evolves over the next few years is to get some consistency and continuity. So if you're a luxury tour operator, and you take a group to Bogota and you have a five-star experience at the Four Seasons, if you're going to proceed then on that itinerary to Medellin, you need a similar quality hotel at that same level because uh, the luxury traveler isn't the type that likes to go up here and then down and then up. So we need that kind of uh, continuity uh, to evolve in the development over the next five years. And with 180 hotels already developed and over 200,000 uh, room nights, um, I'm confident that that will happen, but I think when it does, it'll just be that much more compelling uh, mm -hmm. to the U.S. traveler. So there is there another uh, investment opportunity Correct. that can be yeah. taken. Uh, from your experience, going out of your own fields, where else you see Colombia is an opportunity for investors, uh, given the fact that we have this growing middle class that has many needs in, in a variety of aspects, yeah. Yeah, I think for us, as, as Julio mentioned, the, the growth of the middle class and intended consumerism is the main pillar of, our, of any business that we get involved with. Secondarily, we look for inefficient debt or equity. Um, and then lastly, businesses that are kind of early in their curve of institutionalization. The thread through any of these businesses will be real estate. But if we take a step back, and certainly oil and gas is a huge opportunity long term, Infrastructure is another um, area where I think Colombia is probably, be again, better paused, 
that are poised. Um, infrastructure investment is required anywhere. I mean, we can look here in New York, and before you even get to any of the airports and cross the bridges, there's significant infrastructure that this president may get involved with or not. Um, I think Columbia is well poised to get a lot of that done. That will, of course, benefit, make everything much more efficient, effective. Um, I think if you think about evolving societies anywhere, but we see this kind of across emerging markets, once the basic needs of housing, finance, logistics, transportation are, are covered, you kind of move up the ladder. And health and education are two big areas where we believe, specifically in Colombia and, and, and more broadly in the region, represent areas of significant investment and opportunity. And, and I think the advantage in some cases of being later in the implementation of some of these is, is the ability to leapfrog and take lessons learned from other countries and not uh, pay some of the prices and costs that, that other uh, economies or societies have done. But I think, again, in the case of education and, and health care, there's a lot to do. Um, we're certainly trying to figure out how to fit that in within the real estate framework, but I think beyond our lens, there should be real opportunity in those sectors as well. Okay. Yeah, in, in our case, um, so a few things. Uh, first, uh, Colombians, and it's not only Colombians, but I think a number of other Latin American uh, countries is the same, but Colombians are brand lovers. They love brands. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so uh, this is what we see with some of our brands. And obviously, we're a brand, we're a brand business, and uh, we think that is a lot of potential to bring uh, more brands than the ones you already have. Not necessarily only the luxury brands, but also the, the kind of the aspirational and the more uh, mass market um, uh, global brands uh, that we have in our, in our portfolio. So there's clearly the potential to do that. Another space, as I mentioned earlier, is uh, which uh, we think that is a lot of room for development is in, in the other health and beauty uh, area. Uh, Colombians are very uh, health conscious and uh, conscious of their self appearance. And, uh, and this was the reason for doing, uh, for doing body tech, but uh, there are a number of other businesses, uh, and again, this is a kind of vertical where we are very uh, focused on. Uh, for instance, in Brazil, we did a laser hair removal uh, uh, chain, which uh, that is also some other um, um, skin uh, uh, beauty treatments, and I think uh, and we've got a number of companies in that s space as well. And again, I think that's clearly an area of, uh, of opportunity for, um, for us in, um, in Colombia. And then the other thing, as I said, uh, you know, again, but it's with respect to the experiential uh, the businesses in a number of, of, of verticals, uh, tourism, uh, dining, some, uh, some uh, retail concepts as well, which, uh, which I think uh, we're, we're, we're kind of doing a laser focus in, in some of those uh, spaces because we think those are particularly attractive in, uh, in the country. So you, with that, do you touch on uh, how uh, the middle class in Colombia may be uh, slightly or completely different from middle class anywhere? Uh, so I wanted just to ask the three of you, how is Colombia different from other countries in Latin America? In your case, Terry, you, I know you've been to, uh, I imagine, I don't know, 100, 100 countries in the world and yes. in Latin America, many of them. Yes. How is, um, how is I, Colombia different? I have to say, and again, um, it may sound like a cliche, but I think the greatest impact uh, ended up being the people. And I don't know whether you've got an extraordinary training program for frontline hospitality uh, folks in Colombia or whether it's just part of your DNA. I think it's probably a combination of both. But I can tell you, uh, sitting at breakfast, and having one of the most compelling messages delivered by somebody pouring my coffee, who just merely said, we need you and your friends and your family to come back to Colombia and share our story. And he said it in such a sincere, believable way, it could not have been taught. It came from the heart. And I think that that's what we kept uh, finding time after time, was that people are really, um, connect from the heart in Colombia. And I think that's what's gonna make it, or does make it different to any of the other uh, countries that uh, we go to. Any difference in, uh, in the country itself, the middle class in Colombia, is it different? I think one of the distinguishing characteristics, I mentioned this before, is the geographic diversity and GDP diversity. So when we think about our logistics business, for example, um, we're, we're in Peru, but we're likely only gonna operate in one or two locations in Lima, for example. 
in Costa Rica, we're in San Jose. We may have one or two locations in San Jose. In Colombia, we're going to have probably multiple locations in Bogota, but we're also going to have a presence in Medellin, Cali, perhaps Cartagena, because there are distinct, significant population and, and economic activity beyond the capital. And I think that and that bodes well for hospitality as well. Where, you know, you're you're if you if you're going to Peru, you're going to do Lima and then Cusco probably, or maybe the jungle. Um, whereas if you come to Bogota, if you come to Colombia, you've got five or six real cities to visit beyond, and then getting to the more uh, tourist destinations. That are, that are very different from each other too, it's just a, a continuation. Uh, that uh, diversity also, uh, maybe because Colombia is in a really privileged location, will allow to grow your business also regionally. You speak about scale, I guess scale for you is also important maybe inside the country or regionally. So I want to talk about Colombia as a, uh, as a place that connects through trade agreements with other countries and, uh, and also because it has a really good uh, geographic location. And, and in terms of uh, Terry, how you have travelers going to South America, maybe they will be the only time they go, so maybe Colombia is just one point that will allow them to go to other places too, so. Uh, yeah, so certainly this is one of the, the places that we try and, and do in most of our uh, investments is not only to invest in something that is, works well in a country, but you can expand uh, regionally, and that was yeah. clearly the case of uh, BodyTech, which is the largest uh, gym uh, uh, operator in the region and has a strong presence already in Chile and Peru, and we think that they have the, the, the capacity of to further expand the, the concept uh, elsewhere. Also, uh, you know, similarly, in the case of Maji, obviously the free uh, trade agreements uh, with the U.S. have been extremely useful for a number of, um, of businesses. If you think about that company, which is you know, kind of a mid-sized uh, business, about 80% of its sales are done into, uh, into, the, into the North America, U.S. and, and so Canada. Let me so stop quickly for that. So the, if not for the FTA, you probably wouldn't have looked into well, it would, you know, the business would have been most likely much smaller and it would have been much more difficult for them to mm -hmm. penetrate uh, the, the U.S. So mm -hmm. clearly that's, uh, that's uh, an advantage that a uh, few other uh, Latin American uh, countries have for the time being. And, uh, and, you know, obviously the U.S. being the largest uh, consumer market in the world and just being at, at your uh, doorstep is a, is a fantastic opportunity for, for those businesses. Said that, you know, the U.S. market in, in apparel and... And, and those sectors is, is obviously extremely tough, extremely competitive. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But precisely, you know, what I, what I was talking about uh, earlier, the, the capacity to manufacture at reasonable prices, very high uh, quality products such as Maji does uh, locally and being able to export them and sell them at a reasonable price and making a reasonable margin on them in the U.S. shows the, the, the strength of that, um, of that uh, sector and those, those maquilas in that, in that region. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I would just say that regrettably the U.S. traveler is time deprived. We don't have as much time as our European colleagues. So historically, we will package a couple of countries together. We'll try and see as much as we can in the shortest amount of time. Having said that, and having just uh, returned from Colombia, I think Colombia is unique and has the potential to stand on its own for a good seven, nine day itinerary um, without packaging it with a Peru or someone else. Because I think to Thomas's point, when he was talking about the diversity of these different regions, that makes for such a rich uh, traveling experience that uh, I think Colombia can indeed support itineraries um, in and of itself. Doesn't mean it won't be packaged, but I think uh, we'll see it as a standalone uh, destination. Excellent. For you, scale is important. What do you need in order to be able to take your business to the Andean region, for right, example? Right, so that's a good question. When we think about Colombia, um, so far at least, it's been a component of a regional platform. So our logistics business operates in Costa Rica, Peru, and Colombia, and those three markets uh, we'll probably develop eight to 10 million square feet over the next three to five years, which is a good sized business that could either be listed through one of the public markets um, or sold to an institutional investor that wants scale. Um, we wouldn't be able to develop a scalable business in this sector on its own in Colombia. 
the hotel business that we're in Mexico has a presence and will continue to build a presence in, in Colombia. But we have not found yet a business that, that can get to its scale in Colombia by itself. But I think another important component is Colombia and Colombians, you know, quote unquote, play well in the sandbox regionally with their neighbors, which is not, you know, is easily said when you talk about the Chileans and the Argentinians or the Brazilians and the Argentinians. It's not as easy to get uh, groups working together. And so I think the regional um, opportunity and then layered on top of that, the ability of Colombians generally to play well with neighbors creates uh, real opportunity. Mm -hmm. For for potential investors that may be watching uh, this event, what uh, cities they should be looking at in Colombia? What would be the three, four cities that they should be approaching besides Bogota, obviously? Well, obviously, it depends on the on the sector. I've mentioned Medellin as clearly a, as a, an area of excellence uh, in uh, manufacturing, in, uh, at least in the sectors that uh, we look at. Mm -hmm. um, you know, obviously uh, Cartagena. Actually, in Cartagena, we 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 did our uh, our advisory board. We have a, a yearly advisory board. We invite all our LPs, most of them uh, Americans, um, and uh, we we invited them uh, to uh, to Cartagena, and it was. Uh, an amazing uh, success because it's such an amazing uh, place for mm. from a from a tourism point of view. I think there's less less manufacturing in in Cartagena. It obviously, you know, for us it depends on the on the on the specific uh, opportunity. But but you know, t to to the point uh, that uh, you were making earlier, is that uh, there is uh, a number of cities where you can build. Uh, in our case, uh, networks of uh, stores that uh, that can be you know that can work well and that be uh, profitable, not, and not only one city. So you have you know four or five cities where you can think about uh, developing a, a business, which is uh, one of the good assets of uh, of the country. Mm -hmm. and, and just for us, probably Cali and Medellin behind Bogota uh, to start, and then the rest of it would be driven more by tenant demand as opposed to us going out ahead of tenants. Mm -hmm. And I would just say, as, as our members develop product, um, we are always challenged with and tasked with finding some new fresh twist. So while we had a chance to see three amazing cities uh, over the last week, we heard about another half dozen regions that we didn't even have a chance to scratch the surface on. So that's all very encouraging for us, because every time you introduce a product, um, we have to make it different and more unique and more interesting every mm -hmm. time we go back to the market and say, Colombia is why you should go and visit, and here are the reasons we're giving you. So we constantly have to reinvent uh, the experience, and I think Colombia has enough diversity uh, for us to do that for many, many years. Mm -hmm. Going back to the peace agreement, in the case of tourism, I think it's, it's very clear that uh, perception is everything. and. Uh, with the wrong perception, you won't have people really willing to go. In your cases, uh, you started looking uh, into Colombia and actually going to Colombia before that. So my question is, what has changed and what is the potential of this new post-conflict phase? How does really concretely impact your businesses? It's difficult to say how it directly impacts our businesses. I think in the short term, the benefits will affect the Colombian people directly, um, in some ways directly, in other ways indirectly. Mm -hmm. But I think as a national process and b rebuilding, um, most of the benefit, again, at least in the short term, will be locally felt, mm -hmm. which is great. Mm -hmm. um, we weren't... Um, we weren't looking at or making investment decisions on whether or not the peace agreement was going to happen. We hoped and thought that it would. It was a question more of when, not if. And um, we were pleased, of course, that it has occurred. But I think that in the short term, you know, hopefully the agro industry and things will, um, that, that opportunity will be exploited the right way in Colombia. But that's going to take a long time. I think. Our view also is the impact is going to take a long time for this to be implemented and successfully done. 
and so I would say, again, it, it, it's more locally felt, but it's, I, I think for the perception, the international or the ex Columbia perception is very pos positive, but the impact not, not directly felt. That's okay. mm -hmm. I mean, it's obviously gonna um, be an incentive for, for uh, foreign investors to come into the market. We've been looking at the market before and we've done investments before in other, in, in past life of uh, uh, the, the fund. But uh, definitely this is something that obviously is gonna give a boost of uh, confidence to uh, locally, but also to international investors. Uh, that's gonna create more investment coming from, uh, from abroad. And uh, it will certainly have a, a good impact on the, on the economy. It will be felt you know, throughout perhaps a certain amount of, of time, but it's, it's, it's clearly this type of kind of normalization uh, uh, processes. And I've lived, I'm, I'm Spanish myself, I've lived something uh, similar in, in Spain with a completely different dynamics, but with respect to the, the, the terrorism in, uh, of ETA, which uh, we had a, a problem yeah. for, for, for years. And uh, when it was sorted out, uh, basically it, give it, it gave a boost of confidence to the, 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 the local market, but also to the foreigners coming in and investing in the market and so on. So it's, it's uh, definitely uh, fantastic news and it goes in the, in the right direction for sure for the country. Mm -hmm. And I think for us, it's really the symbolism that it represents and it opens a door uh, for dialogue with the US traveler. So uh, I think it's quite huge uh, the way it can be transformational uh, in the image of Colombia. So I think you know the timing could not have been better. And I, I also want to just veer off uh, for one second because when we talk about investment, uh, you really have to have confidence in your partners that you build. And I, I wanna say how extraordinary pro Colombia is, not because Felipe is right here in the front row, but we have an opportunity to deal with variations of pro-Columbia from all over the world. Yeah. And I can tell you the attention to detail, the professionalism, the pride that they uh, exhibit um, really makes a difference. So it, if you're investing in a partnership, pro-Columbia is the right vehicle uh, to build that relationship with. You can make a commercial with that. Yeah, well, that you have to, you have to use it. <laughs> Thank I you, mean Terry. it. I mean. <laughs> I think I have, I have time for one more question for me. Uh, you are pioneers on what you are doing, uh, going really early, early um, adopters, if I can say that. Going to Colombia. Uh, are you? How are you seeing among your peers? Are you seeing as doing something that other people are not doing? Do you see a trend and you are just the first uh, funds going into Colombia investing in, in sectors that are not the traditional sectors that have been looked at in Colombia? Yeah, I, mean, I think we, we build on our kind of our capabilities and our, and our strength in that from that point of view, I think it, you know, everyone has follows this his own uh, strategy, uh, but uh, clearly we think that um, uh, the, the last uh, couple of years and probably the next uh, couple of years are going to be excellent times to invest uh, in, in Colombia and a number of countries, frankly, in the region, but in particular in Colombia. Um, uh, with more and more people coming in, more capital flowing into the country, you know, prices may go up. Which is uh, obviously something we don't we don't we don't like as uh, as buyers. Yeah. So uh, <laughs> so uh, on the other hand, we don't want to have too much incentives for people to come well, <laughs> to this come this in this event and uh, be more uh, bring more competition. But yeah. uh, I definitely think that uh, it's been a good time for the last couple of years, and going to be still a good time for uh, to invest in the country for for the next couple of years for sure. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I would have to say the opportunity for us is. How do we inspire and motivate the 140 businesses who weren't with us uh, for the last week in Colombia? So um, we're working on that now as far as how do we tell the story in appropriate and compelling way so that they share the same enthusiasm that we share and hold today. And I'm sure we'll do it. Mm -hmm. And I think there's also a benefit. Um, uh, there's certainly risks associated with being early being your word pioneer, um, sometimes you end up taking some arrows, um, but hopefully you, you don't take too many, and you also establish a beachhead and you establish a track record in the country uh, for making good investments and make, being a good partner, 
And that's very valuable because the local operating partners value and are going to prefer somebody that's actually done something in Colombia as opposed to done something similar somewhere else and being, being known for and being able to check you out as a partner or as a potential partner with other folks in the industry. I mean, all these industries are very small, yeah. very well connected. And so by actually being in the country and making investments, one is able to separate themselves from a lot of other people that talk about it but, but may not do it. The, yeah, absolutely. Okay, thank you so much. It's been great. And I think uh, we may have some questions from the audience. Thank you. Yes. Hi, my name is Thomas de Kuna. I have a question for Julio and Thomas at the same time. Uh, looking at the retail in this country where we see a decrease in bricks and mortars and an increase in logistics due to e-commerce, do you see that trend in Latin America uh, growing, uh, i.e. the reduction in malls and uh, the, the, the increase of uh, e-commerce? Thank you. Yeah, obviously the digital transformation that uh, is happening in, in the developed uh, Markets like the you know more developed market like the U.S. or, or Europe is, is definitely happen, happening in uh, in Latin America. You still have uh, a number of issues uh, related with uh, payment uh, systems uh, security as well as uh, logistics. That is uh, still a, a little bit of a of an obstacle for the development of, uh, of that market. So. You know, those need to be sold before really uh, uh, digital uh, takes off as uh, as strongly as is taken in in, in in some other markets. But on the other hand, you know, other you know, obviously the, the, the mobile uh, technology, which is now you know growing much faster, obviously than laptop and uh, and so on, are, are things that are happening faster in those markets than uh, so they basically jumped uh, steps compared to to other other markets such as the U.S. and, and Europe. But as I say, there are still a number of uh, obstacles. Uh, you know, basically physical obstacles uh, in terms of the payment methods and security and the and the logistics that uh, that make it that you know it's 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 work in progress. It's a good question, Thomas. I think um, what I mentioned before about leapfrogging. This is an opportunity for for countries that that all all the Latin American countries, Colombia included, but if you look at even Brazil, Mexico, are very under retailed in terms of GLA per capita versus the US or other developed markets. So there's been overbuilding and you're seeing that show up today in the US with a lot of these stores being closed. It's, it's underdeveloped by a huge magnitude. And so I think number one, um, the, the, the obstacles exist there in terms of logistics, getting infrastructure, getting things where they need to be quickly. Um, we see that as an opportunity, which is why we like the logistics space and in fact, the e-commerce business, if you look at the operations of that business, requires two to three times more cubic feet than a traditional logistics operator. So as a logistics property operator, we love that business. We love Amazon, we love those kinds of companies because they're great tenants. Um, but then I think what, what also is showing up in Brazil, for example, we own one of the largest shopping center businesses, is we want to make sure that we've got the dominant mall or malls in a city. And those will withstand the test of time. But tertiary malls or smaller cities that can't really support more than one or two malls are the ones that are at risk. And so I think from a development perspective and an ownership perspective, you want to make sure that's where you focus. Mm -hmm. uh, good morning. Daniel Rachman is still other. I would like to add my own uh, positive experience having set up recently operations in Colombia after 20 years working with a distributor and congratulate the government of Colombia for really the very straightforward and professional and easiness of doing business and setting up operations, opening up bank accounts, licenses and so forth. So really a great experience. Um, we already have 200 people in, in Colombia after just six months going to 1,000 in the next uh, five years great experience. However, I think there are still many areas where Colombia needs to step up the game in order to reach the status, Philippe, that you were talking before. And one is regulatory. And um, even though the INVIMA is an incredibly efficient and professional agency, the cost of product registration in Colombia are by far the highest in all of Latin America, twice what it costs in Brazil, which we know is the worst country in Latin America. So if you want to do business in, in Colombia and just come in with, let, let's say, 2,000 SKUs, you're talking about $3 million in investment just before starting to play. So is there any plan to streamline the product registration process and maybe work with the FDA so that we don't need to register product twice? That's my first question. And the second has to do with informal economy. 
the San Andresitos. Colombia is the only country in Latin America where there is a government tolerated uh, retail business, which is basically uh, built with goods which are smuggled from uh, Panama and which destroy the equity of the brands which are sold. So I know that that generates a lot of uh, uh, jobs for the Colombia government, but what are the plans for Colombia to formalize all the business and allow uh, luxury brands to be in Colombia without the fear of seeing your products sold, sold on the street at half the price? Um, well, thank you for your trust in Colombia first. I'm really glad to hear you say that uh, you're making a good uh, investment uh, this, in this particular year in, in our country. Um, to be completely honest, I'm not uh, cert uh, sure about the INVIMA uh, issue. Uh, I don't know if there's some process on, uh, under, uh, that is taking place right now to lower the prices. Um, but part of our, our job is to hear those type of issues from investors and try to work our work with local authorities to solve them. So I will follow up on that. Um, it shouldn't be like that. Uh, so if uh, I can assure you that we'll look into it and, and make sure that something happens in, in that regard. And uh, the San Andresitos is not something that we handle directly from, from Pro Colombia, obviously. Um, but uh, what I can tell you is that the government, the Colombian government as a whole, is working really hard in making sure that uh, Colombia is a country well, where the rule of law is the norm uh, and that applies to every aspect of business uh, and Colombian society. So uh, you, 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 you can be sure that uh, that's not something that it's. Uh, common and generalized around the country. So it's not something that I can from Colombia uh, talk uh, in, in depth, but I can tell you that that's not uh, something that it's common or the norm uh, within the Colombian economy. Catalina Borrero, I wanted to uh, ask the two private equity gentlemen about the tax reform that just passed in Colombia. Um, there's a disconnect in my mind because I, uh, I see FDI and it's healthy and obviously you're investing in Colombia, but I deal with entrepreneurs and there's a lot of uncertainty and people looking at other jurisdictions because they get tax continuity or um, I mean, some say that it's cheaper to build their goods even here in New York because they get so many subsidies. Um, what's your view on, on that? Yeah, well, obviously, the, it's had a little bit of an impact on, on, uh, on consumption. Uh, I'm not an uh, a, uh, expert in, uh, in macroeconomy in, in Colombia, but I think, I guess, the, the, the reason why it's, it's been done is uh, for other macro reasons to... Uh, to uh, to lower uh, the the budget deficit of the of the country, and uh, to fund uh, you know to fund the government with uh, to provide additional funds to the government to do the investments they need to do. So, you know, I guess it's been done for the for the good of the of the macroeconomy, but it certainly had had uh, some impact in uh, in uh, consumption. But I think, in the end, you know, for, for me, you know, consumption. Uh, needs to be boosted by having a strong economy uh, and a strong macroeconomic environment and not through short-term investments. So I think hopefully if that you know, has a positive impact on the macro, it will eventually have a positive impact on, on the consumption, on the private consumption in the, in the future. And I think if the growth of the country continues as, as, as it has been, you know, hopefully uh, that would be the case. Yeah. Any comments? I would just add, I mean, it's a, it's a necessary cost. It's, it's not uh, ideal. But we're, again, in Colombia as part of a regional platform, tenants, and are, we, we focus on the logistics side, consumer good, freight forwarder, and logistics provider. And those businesses are going to be in Colombia because of the growth of the middle class and the market. The margins may be a little bit lower, cost of business a little bit higher, but they still have to be there. We're not dealing with people that can decide kind of which country they want to be in or not on this platform. It's unfortunate, and we think it'll probably improve over time. Thank you. I think we have time for one more question. Hi, yes, Adrian Dixon from Blue Heron Research Partners. 
In Julio's presentation, he presented Colombia as number one in terms of guarantees for investors and conflict resolution. My question is for, for Thomas and for Julio. Um, is that true? What's your impression? And can you benchmark it against other countries in the region? Well, in my, in my case, I, uh, luckily enough, I had no uh, experience uh, in dealing with, uh, with that so far. So uh, I, I, hope, uh, <laughs> I hope he's right, and I hope uh, if, ever, if that ever happens, I, I benefit from that, although I hope I never had to benefit from that kind of resolution. So I don't have experience on that, sorry. Yeah, we, we also have not had uh, to resort to conflict resolution, but I would tell you that a country's ranking of where they fit is not going to factor into our decision of investing. Um, whether it's one or, or eight, um, it, you don't want to get to that point because if you've gotten to that point, things are, things are in really bad shape. From our perspective, and I'm sure to Julio, it's, it's uh, finding great partners and, uh, and structuring deals that, uh, that have aligned interests and, and, and realize that things are going to be bumpy and volatile and never, you know, we, we always say on the business plan, the only, the only number that's accurate is the date. Um, everything else is going to be different. Um, but if you find the right partner and have the right aligned long-term interests, you, you should be okay. And that's what we focus on. Very yeah. well. So uh, thank you so much, Thomas, Terry, and Julio. Uh, I think this was really enlightening and, uh, and interesting and fresh, which is what I imagine people appreciate. And uh, I thank you, our audience, for joining us today. And I invite you to give a hand to our speakers. Thank you so much. Thank you.